Good afternoon and welcome to the Seattle Lambda Legal Garden Party. 2020, I think, is going to be a year that we will not soon forget. And I'm sorry that I'm not with all of you here in Susan and Eric Benson's beautiful garden, but we are nonetheless delighted that you're able to join us this afternoon to support this fantastic organization. My name is Jamie Peterson, and I'm the chair of Net Lambda Legal's National Leadership Council. I've been doing that for a few years, and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to this unusual event that we're having uh, virtually this afternoon. I wanna extend a huge thank you to Susan and Eric. If we were all at their house, it would be the 17th year that they've been hosting this event, and we're extremely grateful to them uh, for opening up their home to us, including during this pandemic time, uh, to be able to say hello to you. Uh, we also would like to thank Alaska Airlines, which has generously provided some tickets that you're gonna be hearing a little bit more about later in the program, as well as outstanding financial support to Lambda Legal as a national sponsor. And a thank you to all of you who have been donating for so many years to Lambda Legal, to the great progress that we have seen uh, both this year with the fantastic victory from the Supreme Court uh, on the question of anti-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people nationwide, and on issues uh, ranging from marriage to school bullying to service in the military. And one of my favorites uh, as a scout leader now, uh, the Boy Scouts and the tremendous societal change that we've made there. Lambda Legal is fighting for us every day and for all of our rights and for that Thank you, because it is your donations that have made that work possible. It is now my great honor to introduce a real pillar of our community for as long as I've been around. Uh, Louise Chernin, the president and CEO of the Greater Seattle Business Association, GSBA, is the recipient this year of the Lambda Legal Seattle Leadership Award. Louise has been a leader on all sorts of issues, uh, making GSBA the largest gay and lesbian chamber of commerce uh, in the country and paving the way with hundreds and hundreds of scholarships for LGBTQ students, uh, also doing advocacy work at the city and the state level uh, that combines the need for social change uh, with good protection for small business. Uh, and she's brought a whole group of people together to help with that work. Louise has a lifetime uh, of service to our community as a leader in the LGBTQ movement, in the women's movement, and for social justice more generally. And it is my great honor to present the Seattle Lambda Legal Award to Louise Chernin. Louise? Hi, I'm Louise Chernin, President and CEO of GSBA, Washington State's LGBTQ and Allied Chamber of Commerce. I'm really delighted to accept this award from Lambda Legal. It's quite an honor. I want to thank Jamie Peterson, and I want to thank Ann Crook and, this, and the Seattle leadership team of Lambda Legal. I've been with GSBA for quite a long time, starting in 1992 when they came to my association management firm and asked for some support. Prior to that, I had always worked in the women's movement with Seattle Now, and I've done work around reproductive rights, women's rights, civil rights, um, uh, all sorts of other anti-nuclear movements. So it was quite a change to be asked to work for a business organization. And I thought, hmm, am I gonna be working for the man? So I was a little reluctant, but I was really delighted to meet with GSBA and find out that small business owners, they really are the heart of a community Community. They're very active, and GSBA was a unique and wonderful organization, although at that time, mostly gay men. It's changed quite a bit in the last 40 years, and now it's an organization that's far more diverse with men and women and the bi and trans community a part of it. The work that we do is around business development. We also have a scholarship fund where we invest in the next generation of leaders. And of course, we work predominantly with small business. We started out 40 years ago because we wanted to find each other and support local small businesses that were LGBTQ owned.
But shortly thereafter, we realized there was rampant discrimination and we needed to work on issues of bias and discrimination in the city and most especially with the police and fire departments. So here we are 40 years later, full circle, when all of us are still addressing rampant discrimination, bias and violence from our police departments. I want to thank Lambda Legal for all the work they have done to increase legal opportunities and equality for the LGBTQ community. I believe when they work together with groups like GSBA that are using business as a platform for social justice, we can make great change. We have our work cut out for us now because we still have discrimination in our community, most especially for our LGBTQ communities of color and for our trans community. I hope that we can challenge ourselves right now to look at economic equity and work with black and brown led and other people of color led organizations to see what else do we need to do to dismantle systemic racism. Surely our organizations, which have been predominantly white led, need to do more. We need to work with those that are in leadership roles in those black and brown led organizations to find out what can we do together to make equity a reality for all in our community. So again, thank you for this honor. I look forward to the work we're going to do to make important changes in Seattle, in Washington state and across our country. Thank you. My name is Ann Crook and I serve on Lambda Legal's board of directors. Usually I get to greet you at the entrance to the garden party and I miss being able to do that this year. I'd like to join Jamie in thanking Louise for her decades of service to our communities. We are more fortunate than I can say to have had the benefit of her work and her dedication. Now I'd like to introduce two of Lambda Legal's superb legal team to talk about the current work that all of you watching today are making possible with your support. Jenny Pizer is Lambda Legal's Law and Policy Director based in our Los Angeles office and has been a frequent and welcome visitor to Seattle. Ava Tara Smith Carrington is our Tyrone Garner Memorial Law Fellow based in our Dallas office where they work on litigation, policy advocacy, and public education addressing inequalities in law and policy for black LGBTQ people and for black people living with HIV. Jenny and Ava Tara, welcome. The virtual floor is yours. Well, thanks so much, Anne. That was so good of you to say, very generous. And Avatar and I are just delighted to be with you and everyone else for this garden party. Virtually, we wish we could be there in Seattle. Seattle is so beautiful and it's so nice to be with people uh, in person, but uh, we're grateful to have this opportunity to be with you virtually and you know, to, to share some conversation about the work that is uh, keeping us busy. Um, it is a busy time, as everybody knows, and at Lambda Legal, we, uh, we are working around the clock to deal with the problems. So let's get started. So Ava Tara, it's great to have this opportunity to chat with you about uh, focusing on uh, a really extraordinary piece of work that, uh, that you did together with Puneet um, last month uh, as we were starting to celebrate Pride Month in the middle of uh, elevated national awareness of racial injustice, police brutality, and some of the themes that have been important parts of our movement from earliest days. Mm -hmm. uh, you did this extraordinary written testimony to commission that uh, President Trump has set up about uh, so-called administration of justice uh, that if I uh, recall properly was a bunch of law enforcement people brought together to talk about what a great job they're doing uh, in the midst of a national conversation about how that is actually not the case. I um, wonder if you would uh, talk a little bit about what the testimony was and, and why you decided it was an important thing to do. So uh, when Puni and I were drafting the testimony, I think that you know we knew immediately that uh, this was a time where we were coming off of multiple individuals who are black who had um, just lost their lives due to um, police abuse and violence. 
Um, and then also recognizing the fact that in that, a Black trans man had also um, just had his life taken as well. So we felt that in, do, in writing this testimony, it would be really important to not only think about the history of policing in our community and the history of criminalization when it comes to just LGBT Q people in general, but also kind of like situating it in the current um, moment that we're in. So, you know, the testimony was really honestly quite beautiful to put together. Um, you know, we start off with talking about crime and talking about how it was really a riot against police harassment and abuse, especially in, um, at the time, very gay, queer spaces where we knew for a fact that police would come in, disrupt spaces, or arrest people just simply for existing, right? Um, because they could, and there was no accountability, and there was also rampant discrimination. And I think that in drafting that, what we did was that we made very clear that like policing in the LGBTQ community is nothing new. Um, that, you know, for so long, um, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people have um, been uh, kind of the victims of police violence uh, due to the fact that for so long there were like laws on the books that allowed for that type of um, harassment and abuse to occur. And then, in, you know, in situating it there, we moved effortlessly, honestly, into talking about like, so what does policing look like right now? Um, and a lot of that looks like, you know, kind of obviously remaining focused on the LGBTQ community, but being really super specific and thinking about, so who in this community is more likely to have interactions with police due to um, under or unemployment um, being uh, homeless, uh, experiencing discrimination in employment, which all leads to an increased likelihood of being involved with the criminal legal system. So for us, when we were drafting this, it looked like talking about Black, Indigenous, people of color who are also LGBTQ. It looked like being very clear in discussing the ways in which people in both urban and rural communities are policed. It looked like talking about how undocumented people are also police and that, you know, undocumented people are also part of our community. Um, so with all that being said, it was just very important that we were supposed to make sure that we wanted to create those connections and keep them together. So among the things that I think this document did so powerfully was show the connections between the different systems in which we can find ourselves. You know, we have different bodies of law that apply to education or to police misconduct or to immigration and asylum uh, as if they're separate. But this testimony does a beautiful job, I think, of showing the relationships um, among these different sectors of our lives. I think that our goal is to really walk someone who might not have any familiarity with how these systems are connected straight through a process where it becomes very clear that there is a, a line that you can literally draw from talking about the fact that when people experience discrimination, whether it's in public accommodations, employment, housing, whatever, what have you, um, especially people who are LGBTQ and people who are also Black, Indigenous people of color who are LGBTQ, when they experience discrimination in those spaces, that means that they are more likely to be pushed into positions where, again, there is going to be that heightened risk of involvement with the criminal legal system. And so we go from there to really talking about what it means to be in urban, rural, whatever, what have you, in certain spaces where there's already over-policing in the community, right? Because when there's already over-policing in the community, that means that there's a likelihood that you're going to interact with police more often than not, whether you want to or not. <laughs> and so walking from there to that point, and then also talking about how police might respond to this individual, right? So if you have someone who's like me, a Black non-binary individual who is sometimes read as masculine presenting, there are times when I, as a person walking through a certain space, will be seen as a Black man. And what does that mean when you are perceived that way by a police officer? And we know that at the end of the day, there is bias in policing, right? There is There are discriminatory actions that occur on the part of police because of maybe training or just personal beliefs that in interacting with me, it will be um, what could happen will look a little bit different than what might happen with peers who are white or who are brown. So there, there's that conversation. So we walk from there in terms of talking about the lack of opportunities in our community due to discrimination in general to talking about what happens when you are in spaces where you are more likely be, 
more likely to be police because of just like over policing, heightened surveillance, things like that. And then from there, kind of just walking the person through who's reading this, like how it how simply it can happen. So you're going from policing, which and then criminalization. So like for example, if someone's a sex worker. And we know that, you know, for some individuals, simply existing while trans and walking through the street and possibly holding a condom on them can be just enough proof to say that, hey, we think that you're a sex worker. And so for that, we are going to treat you in this type of way or possibly, you know, levy these certain charges against you. So I think, you know, to be really clear, the goal of just writing that piece, although one can say like, well, is it going to really be beneficial? I think it is beneficial because I think that it's one of few documents that really lays out there what happens to LGBTQ folks when we're talking about policing. Um, and that makes really specific um, that, you know, for BIPOC, for trans people especially, for undocumented people, um, the ways in which um, they are policed and the ways in which they might be treated in those spaces and what happens at the end can look completely different. And that's all because we already understand that our community is not a monolith. And that because of that, all the identities that people hold can put them again at greater risk of having an unfair, unjust experience with all these systems. So I think what makes it really quite dangerous and really kind of harmful right now is that we're also living during a time where obviously because we're doing this virtually, COVID-19 is a thing and that we have watched as a large majority of our population have now um, learned that they are no longer employed, that they have possibly uh, lost their source of income, that they will likely possibly be evicted due to, you know, moratoriums ending and like not having the money to pay rent. So we're seeing all these different combination of things. We already know that our community in terms of LGBTQ people, specifically trans folks, are again, more likely to be under or unemployed, to not have, you know, significant savings that they can rely on, to not also have stable housing or to be homeless. So now again, here's a portion of our population that is being essentially told um, that, if they are to enter into, enter into a shelter system, there is a chance that they will interact with an individual who will police them, who will determine that they are not um, able to come and stay and like spend one night sleeping or however many nights they need to be there sleeping just to rest so that way they can get back on their feet. And so I think that that's incredibly like just a really violent thing right now when you're thinking about the current state of our country and our world where, um, People are just trying to figure out how to get by. And then here's this extra layer of an attack against LGBTQ people, specifically trans folk, um, who might turn to a shelter system because that is their only way to get rest for a night. And again, it all comes back to this like one constant, which is, you know, the allowances that are made to police people for just being who they are in these public spaces um, and also kind of charging other people so not only like you know different state actors but also charging private individuals with being able to do that and I think that that's what hurts especially right now and that's also a sign of like why this work is so necessary and why it's so important that we keep on making sure that we are equipped to like have um, the resources that we need to have in order to fight these fights because as you can see like this administration isn't slowing down. And in fact, as things get worse and worse for our country, um, all I see are constant rules or constant, you know, um, you know, uh, language being put out there that's encouraging um, various entities that can be safety nets for so many people in our community to discriminate against us. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's part of what is absolutely unacceptable and has been driving our work since this administration came in. But even, even before that, I mean, we had this fundamental lie that transgender people and trans women in particular are a threat. That was the lie that, that drove the rules trying to limit who could use which public restrooms. Mm -hmm. We had some good success and, yeah. and we seeing those bills as we were able to to dispel that lie that actually the people most at risk are the trans women themselves. Exactly. <laughs> They're most vulnerable. And, and that's the same issue now when we look at shelters. Yeah. Um, the same lie, and it's the same thing that we will have to tackle as we have tackled um, the, the same inappropriate uh, lies that undergird limits on access to health care. We're suing about that. Uh, mm. That has undergirded who should be providing uh, services for 
uh, for children who need placements. Well, we're litigating about that. Um, we know, you know, there's now a new rule that's just been put out about um, asylum, which basically aims to turn the entire asylum system on its head. I mean, we know mm -hmm. this administration has been explicit about how they feel about refugees and people seeking asylum to escape mm -hmm. persecution. This is a system that has been particularly essential and life-saving for LGBTQ yeah. people escaping persecution abroad, not to say we've accomplished safety here in the US. I mean, that's part of the theme of all this work, but, but that's a proposed rule and yeah. we're now pre preparing for the, what the next steps need to be to stop that. All to say, we had plenty to keep us busy before. And some of these problems have been with us for a couple generations now and beyond that. And now we have a host of new problems that exactly. we're tackling. Some with testimony, some with lawsuits, some with a mix of both. Um, and there's, there's a lot more we have to do. So we, we're pretty grateful to people who provide the resources that allow us to do this work. Uh, we need to be doing more. Uh, some of us who've been doing it for a while are pretty grateful to have colleagues like you who are joining us with energy and uh, new ideas and, and a sense of how profound and interrelated interrelated the problems are. Um, it's, we have a lot of work to do and uh, grateful to have people supporting us and doing it together and giving us a sense that um, we have a lot more to do, but we can do it. Thank you, Ava, Tara, and Jenny. Every time I hear a Lambda Legal attorney describe the work and the difference it makes in people's lives, I am reminded why this organization both deserves and repays our support, and not just in the years when we win at the Supreme Court, but for everybody's lives every day of every year. I'm now delighted to introduce Kevin Jennings, CEO of Lambda Legal. Kevin is the founder of GLSEN. He is the former leader of the Arcus Foundation, which is the world's largest foundation for LGBT rights organizations. And he came to Lambda Legal most recently from the Tenement Museum in New York City. The search committee selected him for the depth and breadth of his history with our movement, for his profound connection to the young people who are our movement's future, and for his ability to connect Lambda Legal to the communities we serve as we drive our country to fulfill its promise of equal rights for everyone. We are thrilled he joined us, and we are delighted to welcome him today. Kevin Jennings. Thank you, Anne. And may I say what a great honor it was to have you as my first board chair at Lambda Legal. And thank you Seattle and Washington State, especially our Seattle Leadership Committee. The response to this year's event was amazing, particularly since we couldn't actually be together in person, which I was incredibly disappointed by, and I look forward to the day when I can come to Seattle and say thank you to all of you in person. I'm nearing my eight month anniversary here at Lambda Legal, and it was about this time last year when I was asked if I'd be interested in taking the helm of this incredibly important organization. And when I was asked that question, I gave it some thought, and I'll tell you why I said yes. I've been working in the LGBTQ rights movement for 35 years. I went to my first pride parade in Boston in 1986. In 1988, I helped students create the first Gay Straight Alliance when I was teaching high school history in Concord, Massachusetts. In 1990, I formed GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, the first national organization dedicated to making schools safe for LGBTQ students, staff, and families. I've spent my entire adult life trying to make a difference for the LGBTQ community. And it's all at risk now. It's very clear to me what the far right strategy is. They are coming for us through the courts. Just as they have undermined the right of women to choose, just as they have undermined voting rights for people of color, they are seeking to undermine the victories that Lambda Legal has so painstakingly won since it was founded in 1973, and to roll back the progress we have made by chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at our rights through the courts until we have nothing left. I am not going to stand by and let that happen. 
and that is why I came to Lambda Legal. Everything I've seen in the eight months I have held this job has confirmed the reasoning that led me to say yes last summer. I see a three-pronged assault happening. Prong one is the demonization of trans people, an attempt to take America's ignorance and to turn it into a weapon to drive a wedge into our movement. Prong two is the attempt to use so-called religious exemptions to make existing protections meaningless, to use them to grant a license to discriminate in the name of religion. And prong three is their shock and awe attack in state legislatures where they introduced over 200 anti-LGBT bills in 2020. In late March of 2020, when every public official in this country should have been focused on the pandemic, instead in Iowa, the state legislature passed two laws attacking trans people and Governor Little signed them into law, one of which, which would have allowed trans people to correct their birth certificates had already been found unconstitutional by Lambda Legal two years before. We had already proven in court that you couldn't stop trans people from correcting their birth certificates, yet the Idaho State Legislature passed a law trying to prevent trans people from doing this in the middle of a global pandemic. Our opponents are like the Terminator. They just keep coming. And the main thing standing in their way is Lambda Legal. That's why we need to continue the fight. The British politician Tony Benn once said, there is no final victory and no final defeat. We're thrilled at victories like the Bostock decision, which in June of this year held that Title VII protects LGBTQ people from employment discrimination. But two things about that decision. Lambda Legal first argued in court that Title VII protected LGBTQ people in 2006. Litigation takes time. It took 14 years to win that case. And number two, decisions can be reversed. The day after that decision, you better believe that our opponents were having emergency meetings, planning their strategy to undermine and overturn it. So I thank you for continuing to stand with us. We are going to mount a robust defense to protect the victories we've won, and we are going to continue to play offense until we have won full and complete equality for LGBTQ people and everyone living with HIV. Thank you, and we truly appreciate your support. Thank you, Kevin, for your work on behalf of all of us and to all of the wonderful staff at Lambda Legal. Uh, a quick reminder for everyone listening that thanks to the generosity of our sponsor, Alaska Airlines, if you are present at the end of the program, you will be eligible for a drawing of two free tickets on Alaska Airlines, so hang around. I also want to remind you that there'll be a tour of the lovely garden, uh, Susan and Eric's lovely garden, so if you can stay and you want to see the garden, how, it, how beautiful it looks this year, please hang around. Now, I'm delighted to bring you one of Lambda Legal's most dedicated supporters, Susan Benson. Susan and her husband, Eric, have hosted and sponsored the Garden Party for 17 years, and they're a big part of the reason this event raises so much money and so many supporters for Lambda Legal. I am grateful and honored to present my first Amazon boss, Susan Benson. Susan. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, this first Thursday in August in our garden is not what any of us expected. It's still a riot of color and texture, but frankly, it's way too quiet. I'm remembering the sounds of the garden party, the rising burble of voices as the garden fills and glasses are refilled, the reverent pin drop stillness of rapt attention when a speaker stands at the microphone sharing his, her, or their story. 
I'm missing your faces, but I'm feeling your presence. This year, <laughs> dear God, where do I even begin? There's clarity in our stories. Believing that, I'll tell you mine. This has been a year of profound personal loss. My husband, Eric's dad, Don, a brilliant mathematician, died last spring at 93. From August through December, we saw my amazing mom, Gloria, the kindest heart ever, through the end of her life in New York. She passed at home a little before Christmas at 95. We flew home to Seattle in January, the day before the first local COVID-19 case from Wuhan made headlines. It was good to be home, but sleep was elusive. Then the pandemic hit in earnest. Suddenly, hugs were lost to us, and my pre-pandemic personal grief felt like a luxury. I was still losing sleep, but now my insomniac's eyes were open with worry over doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers, heroic and unprotected, put in harm's way by a madman. What could I do? Stuck in my house of an age that dictated staying there, what could I possibly do? There's always something you can do. I started rounding up masks from my friends, my veterinarian, my contractor. Two would arrive, five, a mother load of 50, even that was a drop in the bucket. I took to Alibaba, the Amazon of China. Soon, I was staying up all night trading messages with factory reps. I have no Mandarin. The reps had little English, but their messages were so caring, they often made me cry. We'd negotiate terms, always payment upfront. Would they deliver? If not, well, then the money disappeared. But if the masks came, they could save lives. I ordered, they came. My sister's goddaughter, Alyssa, an industrial designer, connected me with a factory in China. Her friend there, Michael, started calling me Aunt Susan, as Alyssa does. And his texts started to feel covert in the context of an administration confiscating PPE imports from China. Michael's texts read, would Aunt Susan like to order? Yes, she would. I ordered again and again. Generous friends pitched in. We imported tens of thousands of masks. We donated to hospitals, bus drivers, Horizon House, where my mother-in-law lives, and Black Lives Matters protesters. The last shipment was delivered to the Navajo Nation just a few weeks ago. There's always something you can do. I started sleeping again. We were gifted with spring sun this year. I've never heard so much bird song in the city. The skies were crystalline. I boycotted news, but then I'd crack and drink it in gulps. How could my heart break and lift at the same time? Each story of medical workers risking everything to provide care showed me it could. White America finally opening our eyes to centuries of systemic violence and racial oppression showed me it could. The story of a young John Lewis putting an orange in the writings of Thomas Merton in his backpack as he headed off to the Edmund Pettus Bridge showed me it could. Ruth Bader Ginsburg squeezing every last drop from her life to protect our rights and battered democracy shows me it could. As my heart lifts and breaks, there's music in my head. The songs from Hamilton are in heavy rotation on my cerebral jukebox. The lyrics fit. I write and I write like I'm running out of time. I do. I've eulogized my mom. I've told her story. That line at the end of Hamilton haunts me. Who lives, who dies, who will tell your story? Tonight, I ask that question of all of us. For your story to be told, it must be a story worth telling. Right now, in this moment, you have the chance to make it so. Your activism is your legacy. So is your kindness, your generosity, and your profound sense of justice for all. Make your story of tonight worth telling. Make it the story of the night your heart opened fully and changed the future. You have all given so generously. We can't thank you enough. But 
If ever there were a time to double down, this is it. The assault this administration is waging on the LGBTQ community is intentional, deadly, and absolutely terrifying. We need every dollar we can raise to fight those who are attacking our hard-won rights. Tonight, we've got serious help. A profoundly generous anonymous donor has created a $25,000 match. So, the money you give right now will go twice as far. Every dollar we raise tonight will be doubled, up to $25,000. Please, do not let a single dollar of that match remain on the table. I know these are hard times. We ask that you give it a level that's meaningful to you. If you've given $50, can you give another $50? Thank you. If you've given $100, can you give another $100? Thank you so much. If you've given $250, $500, $1,000 or more, can you double down? This year, a year that matters more than any other, Eric and I will be doing just that. Please join us. Let's make tonight's garden party the most effective ever. Let's raise more money for LGBTQ rights than we've ever raised before. If we do our job, Lambda can do theirs. And then we can belt this out in the shower and keep it true. Raise a glass to freedom something they can never take away. Raise a glass to the four of us. Tomorrow there'll be more of us telling the story of tonight. They'll tell the story of tonight. Please give, be well. Thank you, I love you all. Susan, thank you so much for those inspiring words and for all of the support that you have given to Lambda Legal over these many years. We are grateful for you and grateful for Eric and thankful uh, for all that you have done to help so many people across the country. I wanna thank all of you who have made time to be with us here this afternoon. I'm sorry that we couldn't be together in the Benson's garden, but I am looking forward to a chance to gather with you all again in 2021. And in the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you for your great support of Lambda Legal's work. Everybody seems to have answers. Every day's a parade of people pushing any agenda that promises a shot at front page. So Peter, yes. how long have you in this garden been dating? So let's see, we started our affair sometime around 2004, it was a casual thing, and um, I've been here ever since. I've seen it through several remodels, I've seen it um, through different projects and JR has been here since uh, before I got here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it was probably 2001 when I first met you, Susan. It was, I was delivering the rain barrels, very first delivery out here, and you asked me if I would moonlight and do some uh, uh, side projects. And so I thought, oh yeah, sure, I, would, I, could, I could take that on. You know, at the time I was kind of crazy busy working uh, for a, a stone supplier, but it was it was funny. We started by building a wall between the uh, the guest house and the carriage house, and looking back, that was probably the the last thing I should have done because from that point on, stones came through that gate as big <laughs> as the as the wall itself. So. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and I'm thinking that was 2001, 2002, the summer 
uh, and, I, and I, I can't remember that, but I, I've been trying to figure out exactly when that, that day was because I remember it was hot and I remember there was two stones up there, one of which is sitting over there by the, the pond and it just recently found its home. So almost 20 years later, that rock, it moved all around the landscape finally made its home over by the uh, by the new the new uh, bog and pond. Sweet. So, yeah, Sweet. Really nice. And now, Peter, you and JR work super closely in envisioning what happens here. And how, how yeah. does that process happen for yeah, you? Yeah, it, it's kind of um, there's an inspiration uh, there's a need or something that sparks it and then we just kind of play off of each other and what is possible in the setting. Um, the pond, or plural, ponds, started out as just part of the garden, another you know extension of this bed behind me, and it was very boggy and very wet. And um, we finally just decided to go with that and create what at first was just going to be a bog. But um, JR got carried away, and I couldn't stop him. And pretty soon there were two ponds and a little stream connecting the two, and he um, figured out the water exchange and the pumps that we needed. And I just followed afterwards and sprinkled some plants around. So when you say sprinkled some plants, you're, you're, you're being modest. You, 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 have, a, you, have, a, you have a vision. Uh, right, right. Well, so that's the, that's the origination point is you see a need somewhere like this is a boggy wet area and it needs to be as beautiful as the rest of the garden. And so just from that need, you get a, a vision of what could be. Um, and you give that space what it needs, um, the right plants for the right exposure um, in an aesthetically pleasing way. And so if you're sticking with what works in the right space, then you're, half your job is done. So when you're so. planning, Peter, are you think, I know you're thinking conditions and what will thrive there, right. but how do you approach color and texture and all of that? Because you have created what we believe is a masterpiece <laughs> and and uh, yeah. a constantly changing one. So how, yeah. do you, how, how do color and texture come into play for you? Uh, I think it's just, um, again, there's like a seed, but that th through the process of making something come to fruition, that is uh, almost obliterated. And you start to work with what works. Um, you you plant what you think it needs and what it would look good and then of those things certain things do better than others and then you just take that as the garden signal as where to go what direction i i always with the new bed i always um wait for it to tell me what direction to take it and i think even though this is our what third year yeah. of the pond yeah. i think we're um we're still following that lead and some of it are happy accidents, and some of it is intentional, and um, it's, like you said, it's just always changing. It has to, it's a garden, so, so you, have, you have to change with it. What have the happiest accidents been? And what have, what have been things that you said, oh, I wouldn't do that again? <laughs> <laughs> the happiest accident was when I took a job uh, here because oh. that was just serendipitous. Oh. Um, I, the mistakes, I think, uh, are fleeting. I don't really remember huge mistakes. There's certain plants that you think it's going to do well here and it just doesn't and you have to start again. But um, I, don't, I don't really remember big mistakes.